Salam, Shalom, Satsriyakal, Peace. My name is Hina Khan Mukhtar, and I am one of the board members here at the Muslim Community Center. And on behalf of the members of the MCC, I would like to express our gratitude to all of our friends from the interfaith community who have shown up today to show their support to us in our time of fear and anxiety and grief. This gathering today was quickly arranged, pretty much at the request of our interfaith community, who kept asking us, what can we do? Where can we come? How do we show our support? Their request reminds me of the famous Persian Sufi poet Hafiz, who told a story about a four-year-old boy whose neighbor was an elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife. Upon, see upon seeing the man cry, the little boy went into the old gentleman's yard, climbed onto his lap, and just sat there. When his mother asked what he had said to the neighbor, the little boy replied, nothing, I just helped him cry. Why is this tragedy feeling so personal? Why is what happened in New Zealand affecting Muslim countries on the uh, Muslim communities on the other side of the globe? What makes this event different from all of the other tragedies we read about in the news nearly every single day? All life is sacrosanct. Pain can't be compared. One person's grief isn't more important than another's. Our prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told us that the community of believers is like one body. When one limb aches, the entire body feels it. And feeling it, we are. But if you want to know why this particular tragedy feels so personal to so many Muslims living in America, I would mention an insignificant detail shown in the news, pictures, and videos that many Muslims have been noticing, and many others probably didn't even see, that, see it. The green carpet. If you look at the carpet in our Islamic center, you may not know that this is actually a very common design for a carpet. Green was known to be the favorite color of our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So many mosques choose green as part of their interior design palette. Those of us who saw the footage of the interior of the mosque in Christ Church immediately noticed how familiar that carpet looked like. Looked. It felt like home. We know how vulnerable and helpless we feel when we prostrate our foreheads onto that green carpet. We know how not ready to fight back we are. We know how not ready to fight back we are when we walk barefoot inside of our mosques on that green carpet. We know that the green carpet is where we sit and reflect and read our Holy Quran before the Friday prayer begins. We recognize the design in the green carpet that points us towards Mecca so that our focus is on somewhere else other than here as we queue up on the lines in an orderly fashion so that we can worship as a congregation. And we know that pretty much every Muslim here has asked himself or herself, what would I do if evil ever came bursting into this sacred space? Where would I run? Where would I hide? How would, how would I protect my children, my parents? The survivors and victims of the New England tragedy looked like members of our community here. People from Bangladesh and Afghanistan and Saudi Arabia and Palestine and Syria and Jordan and Pakistan and Asia and Africa and white converts to Islam. They made up all of the myriad faces of Islam that you see only in those countries that are open to welcoming immigrants and refugees. It felt like home. And the man who killed them looked like any of our coworkers, or classmates, or friends, or neighbors, or teachers. It felt like home. So it's going to take some time. And that's okay. That's how grief works. You can't rush it. 
No one says it better than the same poet Hafiz who wrote, do not surrender your grief so quickly. Let it cut more deeply. Let it ferment and season you as few human divine ingredients can. Something is missing in my heart tonight that has made my eyes so soft and my voice so tender and my need of God so absolutely clear. Traditionally, Muslims begin every gathering that has a blessed purpose with a recitation of the opening chapter of the Holy Quran. It is called the Fatiha, or the opening. We also recite it when someone has passed. I'm gonna take the time now to read out the names of the victims whose identities we do happen to know at this time. Unfortunately, the list is growing as time passes, but we pray that there are no more names to add to this list after today. After I recite these names, we're going to observe, observe a moment of silence while Hafid Amin Mukhtar is going to recite the Fatiha in Arabic, after which he will be sharing the English translation with everybody. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Mukad Ibrahim, age three. Abdallahi Diri, age four. Sayyid Milm, age 14. Khalid Mustafa, age 45, and his son Hamza, age 16. Naim Rashid and his son Talha, age 21. Tariq Umar, age 24. Uzair Qadir, age 24. Sayyid Arib Ahmed, age 26. Ansi Alibaba, age 25. Ramiz Vora, age 28. Farhaj Ahsan, age 30. Mujamal Haq, age 30. Ata Alayan, age 33. Hussein Al Omari, age 36. Muhammad Umar Farooq, age 36. Janaid Ismail, age 36. Osama Adnan Abu Quick, age 37. Zishan Raza, age 38. Kamel Darwish, age 39. Dr. Harun Mahmood, age 40. Husna Ara Parveen, age 42. Sayyid Jahandad Ali, age 43. Muhammad Imran Khan, age 47. Matullah Safi, age 55. Amjad Hamid, age 57. Lilik Abdul Hamid, age 58. Arif Bhai Muhammad Ali Vora, age 58. Ghulam Hussein in his 60s. Karam Bibi in her 60s. Musa Wali Suleiman Patel, age 60. Abdul Fatah Qasim, age 60. Ashraf Ali, age 61. Mohsin Al Harbi, age 63, Linda Armstrong, age 65, Mahboob Khokar, age 65, Muhammad Abdusi Samad, age 66, Ali Al Madani, age 66, Munir Suleiman, age 68, Ahmad Jamaluddin Abdul Ghani, age 68, Hussein Mustafa, age 70, Abdul Qadir Almi, age 70, Haji Daud Nabi, age 71, and still missing, Zakaria Buhyan. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace and blessings to you all. <coughs> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم 
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم تقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Praise be to God, the cherisher and sustainer of the worlds. Most gracious, most merciful. Master of the day of judgment. Thee do we worship and thine aid we seek. Show us the straight way. The way of those on whom thou hast bestowed thy grace those whose portion is not wrath, and who go not astray. Amen. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask Alicia Sheikh to come to the microphone. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. And peace and blessings be upon all of you. As mosques, synagogues, and churches, and schools, and other sanctuaries are gunned down, like I, like many of many others, fall into the state of despair, waiting for the hope to kick in. Like you all, I sat there looking at headline after headline: 49 dead, 50 dead, 51 dead, dead. I became stuck on that word. Everywhere I turned, that, that word echoed. That's when I came across a very timely quote um, that's in the Quran that, I like to re- that I'd like to share with all of you. This quote goes, And never think those that have been killed in the cause of God as dead. Rather, they are alive with their Lord receiving provisions. They are alive they are alive through each and every one of us here today. They are alive. They remind us of how far we've come and how far we have to go. They are alive when we hold each other's hands in solidarity. They are alive as a reminder. They are with each one of us here today, right now, when we hold each other in a loving embrace with every tear. And... I would like to thank everyone for coming out today and to think of them as your own, as your brothers, as your siblings, as your family, not just that, not just those who passed away this past, this week, but those that have passed away before, way before that. Sorry, um, I have no words anymore. On my way here, I was thinking of what I could say. What, what I could say to make this pain a little bit easier. What I could say to alleviate that pain. To, to be able to walk, to be able to wake up and have hope in my heart. But to be honest, I don't have any more words. The hope that I get is from all of you here. The hope that I get is is by looking at you right now. I have no more hope to offer. The only hope that I have is when I hold your hand, when I embrace you, when I thank you for everyone. I generally thank everyone for being here today. Thank you so much. Spojmi Nasiri from CARE.
Assalamu alaikum and welcome everyone. Like many of you in this room, across our communities, the country and the world, I am heartbroken at the tragedy that took place in Christchurch a few days ago. Our deepest condolences go out to the families of those deceased in this terrorist attack. Many of us in this room and all over the world are feeling helpless and want to help in some ways to support one another, to support the Muslim communities. Your presence here, your solidarity and your love means more than you guys would know. It is your solidarity with, with us. It is your love with one another, regardless of race and religion, that empowers us to overcome the hate and the bigotry that we're witnessing at extraordinary levels. Across the United States, we are witnessing Islamophobia on the rise. The Muslim travel ban has been implemented. Mosques have been vandalized. Local government officials denounce Islam, and state legislatures debate anti-Muslim laws. Care has been on the forefront of combating this Islamophobia. However, we have to be honest with one another that we can't be shocked. There's nothing that happened in Christchurch that should shock us. We can't be shocked when six people were shot to death at a mosque in Quebec City a few years ago. We can't be shocked when three extraordinary young lives of students were murdered in execution style at Chapel Hill. We can't be shocked when a man drove a van into Finsburg Mosque in London six months ago. We can't be shocked when 11 of our Jewish brothers and sisters were shot to death in Pittsburgh synagogue last year. We can't be shocked when nine Christians were killed at a church in Charleston. And we can't be shocked in 2012 when a Gurdwara in Wisconsin was shot at where six people died and many were wounded. These are the realities of what we're seeing in our world today. And the way to combat it is to come together as one, regardless of we're Jewish, Christian, Catholic, Muslim, or any other faith that we come from. Our solidarity in one another in today is an evidence of that solidarity that gives us the strength to go on. It is these very sort of events of organizing interfaith events in our community mosques, in our synagogues, in our churches, in our gurdwaras, and in our community centers that empower us to rise against the hate and the distress that's been in our community. Over the last few days, we have seen around the world that love trumps hate, and we must continue our efforts as one. We, should, we must stand against Islamophobia, against anti-Semitism, and anti-immigrant sentiment. And CARE has been in the forefront of fighting Islamophobia over the years, and we will continue to do that. But alone, we can. Together, we can overcome. Thank you. Dr. Asla Tarsi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace be upon you all. I want to echo what was said before me and what will surely be said again after me. And thank each and every one of you for taking out time to show your support to our community uh, in, these, uh, in these difficult times. Unfortunately, I think this is a reminder that no one, no community, no people, no religion have a monopoly on terrorism and violence. Unfortunately, this is a human problem, uh, and we still are working on this so many millennia later. Uh, I wanted to share some reflections on the uh, tragedy that took place. Um, I can't help but think how our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, would be troubled by this. In fact, I think this is very reminiscent of the very society to which he came. For those of you who don't know, he was born into a very tribal society where each group saw itself as an in-group and was threatened by an out-group. And the way in which each group saw ascendancy over the other were endless cycles of violence. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, being a lover of peace, was very troubled by this. And he worked to 
fight against this blind tribalism uh, because they were the tribe of so-and-so and the tribe of so-and-so by introducing a new phrase. It's the tribe of Adam, that we are all Adamites, so to speak. So the human family should trump this. Um, and I believe that this is a, a framework by which we can find healing, God willing. That when we remember that we all come from the same two parents, uh, that we are, there is no in-group and no out-group, we are all one group, God willing, great things can happen. Unfortunately, those two parents have two famous children that we've heard quite a bit about, Cain and Abel. And so we see that this is a human problem when one is threatened by what they see as the ascendancy of the other, what the human being can do. But the Qur'an's narrative of Abel, who it heralds as the moral, the epitome of the moral response says, if, even if you extend your hand to kill me, I shall not extend my hand to kill you, for I fear God, Lord of the worlds. And so therein we have, through that lesson and the life of the Prophet Muhammad as, as Muslims, uh, the answer to this problem, which is these cycles must be broken. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, worked within his context, the way his brethren of the prophets from before, whether Jesus or Moses or Noah, worked to break these cycles through forgiveness. When he was given victory over the people who had fought him tirelessly for over 20 years, and he had the upper hand in terms of the power, he asked them, what do you think I will do today? And they said, you will do what victors do which is to, to kill, to slaughter, to, to take vengeance. And he said, no, today is a day of forgiveness. I say to you what Joseph said to his brothers, there is no blame upon you all after Joseph's brothers did this. And so I feel like this would have troubled the Prophet wasallam, peace be upon him, very deeply. That here we have the human family um, still not healing from these wounds. Uh, and so we have to, uh, we have to, promote what I would what has been called by one of my teachers a social mercy movement and these cycles have to be broken with forgiveness and compassion even those who fight us we have to see them with we have to view them with compassion one of the um, one of the victims husbands today I watched a video an elderly man whose wife was was slaughtered by this man said that he already forgave him and that he loves him because he knows he must have had much trauma and maybe he wasn't loved as a child. And maybe this is what pushed this man to that. He does this in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and all of the prophets. So we have to see humanity in all. There is no in-group, there is no out-group. And I want to again thank all of you for coming here today, our brothers and sisters in humanity, uh, to come and show us the great side of humanity. These tragedies have a silver lining, and we're looking at it right now. We come together, there is much beauty within us, there's much beauty in the world, uh, and this reminds me of the great quote of Martin Luther King, in which he said, darkness will not drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate will not drive out hate, only love can do that. May God fill our hearts with love, compassion, and forgiveness. May he give the families of those affected, and all of us, because it is our family, the patience, and the wisdom to learn from this, and the courage to heal the darkness and the pain in this world. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sean Kumagai from Dublin City Council. Please forgive me if I said your name incorrectly. Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you all. Thank you very much for having me here. And uh, this uh, gathering truly is a testament to uh, the community support we have here. As a member of the Dublin City Council, I, can, I cannot speak for the entire city or for the entire council for that matter. Uh, but I am here as an individual, as a leader within the Dublin community, and I would like to extend my deepest condolences uh, and solidarity to uh, those of you who live, work uh, in Dublin. I uh, want to invite anyone who feels that they have something to say to come to a meeting, uh, to voice 
uh, your opinion, to express your, uh, your civic duty before the community, uh, because that is your right. Uh, the, the hate that we, we are seeing bubble up, uh, not only within our own country, but across the world, is not something that uh, we can simply battle with love alone. We need a radical sense of empathy. We need a radical sense of injustice. We need to collectively rise up and speak up for one another regardless of whether we come from different walks of life or different faiths, we are all human and we must speak up for one another. So I invite you to please um, speak up. Please come and let us find ways where we can work together to create a sense of understanding, but not only understanding, but embrace the differences we have within our community. And I think that through that we can uh, start to address some of this hurt that is happening within our world. Thank you very much for having me. Trish Monroe from Congregation Beth Emick, who's also a Livermore Council member. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be on you and on us all. Um, I'm standing here, I'm not actually in my role as city council member, um, but to represent the Jewish community of Congregation Beth Amick. Rabbi Larry Milder is with you in spirit, supporting you, walking with you in your grief, as do we all. Jews and Muslims and Christians are all children of Abraham. We are all siblings of history and we are family and family stands together. We together here, whatever, whoever we are, whether we belong to a, a, a religious affiliated or not. We are all Americans. Americans must stand together now more than ever. And so we stand with you here as you mourn. This is not the first time we've stood together to protest and grieve. We protested the Muslim ban. We protested when children were separated from their children, when, when parents were separated from their children and those children kept in cages. We have mourned the horrific events of Nazis marching through Charlottesville the murders of nine AME worshipers in Charlotte, Charleston gunned down during Bible study, Jews in Pittsburgh gunned down in Shabbat prayer. And now we stand here with you following mass murder in a Christchurch mosque. Who murders people at prayer? Who finds joy in killing people praising God? In his manifesto, the murderer says he was inspired by rhetoric from the US. We have been a country that stands for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Are we now a country that exports hate? We have claimed to be a nation welcoming of immigrants, a brilliant quilt of different fabrics and colors. What are we now? Our vision is threatened by terrorists who proclaim an extremist vision of white supremacy. And we've seen this before and we know where it leads. So today we stand together, all of us united in support for our Muslim brothers and sisters. Now is the time for mourning. And so I might be jumping the gun a little bit. I forgive the expression. Yet let us remember that we can draw strength from one another as we go forward. And so let us commit to recognizing and calling out hate wherever and whenever it occurs. Evil thrives in darkness. Shine a light on hate and it will wither. Let us commit to participate in the civic life of our cities our county, our state, our country. Let us empower each other through that participation, building a better world for all, not just a few. Let us be grateful for what we have been given and let us work to ensure others are similarly blessed. Let us be kind to each other, even those whose actions we hate, even those who create evil with those words and action. We are all made that Salam Elohim in the image of God. We must fight evil words and evil actions Yet we can also know that those words, those actions, come from broken people. We stand here today to support our Muslim brothers and sisters in their mourning and grief. Let us also commit to work together to build our common future, a future in which we can join together in light and joy and gladness 
for all. Just want Singh from the Tri Valley Sikh community. Assalamu alaikum, Sabah al Khair, Satsri Kaal, good evening to all of you. I don't know where to start with a tragedy like this, and the sad part is this isn't the first time. Whether it is a church in Charleston, or a synagogue in Pittsburgh, or a Gurdwara in Oak Creek, or a mosque in Christchurch. This is the act of hate, deplorable hate. That's what we are here to say. We are one human race. Where we come from, where we live, it does not matter. I've been to New Zealand. I've seen it. That's one of a country which is melting pot like our Bay Area. And sad part is when I was there in 2008, I did notice Christ just was different. Sorry to say, I did feel, being an Indian shopping in the bazaars, I did feel there was a little bit of a chip on the shoulder of even the shopkeepers. So what I'm trying to say is we need to stand together, send a message of love, Martin Luther King, whose birthday we just recently celebrated, said we should judge the person from the, their character, not the color of the skin or their religion. And I 100% follow that. I want you to know all the Muslim community of Tri Valley, Bay Area, and the world, we stand with you. I represent Tri Valley Six Center, and we are really, really hurt from this because our community has been also on the receiving end, not once, but for the last 500 years. And I can tell you how much it hurts. We feel your pain. We don't know how to correct it, but I do know that we all of us need to do something about it. I personally have been supporting Southern Poverty Law Center, I don't know how many of you are aware of it. They publish intelligence report, and their job is to monitor those who are hit mongers. Does not matter whether they call a white supremacist or any other hate group. They monitor them. I don't know how many of you knew when in Wisconsin a kid committed suicide in school because he was, I believe, gay and was bullied, they are the ones who went to the school board and made the change. When a black guy was dragged behind a pickup truck in Texas and killed to his death, the local police smacked their wrist and let them go. But this was the center who went after and had them punished. Why I say that? Because there are certain organizations where we can help and help make a difference. And I would request that you take a look. I will leave this here. And it will be worth it to look for organizations who support a cause to prevent hate mongers. And before I leave, I want all our community, Muslim community to know we stand with you. We feel your grief. Thank you. Reverend Andrew Lavan from St. Bar Bartholomew in Livermore. Good afternoon. I bring you love and greetings from St. Bartholomew's Episcopal Church in Livermore. Let me say that again. I bring you love 
and greetings from St. Bartholomew's Church in Livermore. I just want to let that settle. You are loved by a group of people, many of whom you probably have not met, but we reach out those arms in spirit and in tangible ways, and I just want to make sure that that is known. It strikes me as I stand here today and as I heard this horrible news that if our religion is defined not so much by the doctrine we profess, but by the faith that we actually live in our day-to-day -day lives, that in today's world there are only two religions. There is the religion that, as Dr. Tarsin said, sees us all as children and creatures of the same God. Every single one of us is an Adamite or an Evite. There is no such thing as the tribal divisions between the blessed and the cursed, between the in and the out. Those distinctions simply don't exist in the mind of God and in the economy of God. But then there is the other religion, the tribal religion, the one that says the outsider is a threat that must be eliminated, and that only those that are within the fold can really be called children of the real God. Everyone else is, is less than and is something else. Well, there's no question as I look around this room that nobody would be here if we were not adherents of that first religion. And that first religion has some noble origins. And I think it's important that we all educate ourselves. And I know in a moment of terrible grief, it may be a little presumptuous to speak of that, but I believe that the pathway forward, the pathway that leads to peace, to a world where this happens less and eventually not at all, requires of us a certain depth of understanding that may be greater than we yet have. So this first religion does have some noble origins. If I were to begin a prayer with Most High, Omnipotent, Good Lord, many might guess Islam and not Christianity, obviously not in the English language, as the source of that prayer. But others know that this was the formulation that St. Francis of Assisi almost always used in his prayers. He did not receive this from his training in the Judeo-Christian tradition. He received this from his travels and the experiences and the education that he had going throughout the Muslim lands of the world. We have been interpollinating for so long that we do not know how to exist otherwise, but we try to pretend that we haven't. We try to hold on to notions of ethnic purity, of racial purity, of religious purity, and yet reality always encroaches upon that illusion. Think about it for a moment. I cannot imagine a Christianity without the witness of Francis of Assisi who pulled his wisdom from outside the Christian sphere, or for that matter of St. Thomas Aquinas, who went back to the wisdom of the ancient Greeks and Romans. I cannot imagine an American music without Africa. I cannot imagine so many of the beautiful, artistic, and scientific, and mathematical, and philosophical traditions of the world without the influence of people that those who adhere to those traditions might call the outsider. But there is an even better reason behind adhering to that first religion. Because if there is one thing that all of our varied faith traditions, and I don't mean to erase the differences, we are very different from one another in so many ways, and those distinctions are important and were never meant to be erased. But if there's one thing we hold in common, it's a vision. That vision differs in detail, and it goes by many different names, but whether we call it shalom, or paradise, or heaven, or nirvana, or whatever other name we might give it, we all share that vision of a perfect and blessed peace, 
of a state both inwardly and outwardly where violence and warfare and hatred are simply unknown and unconscionable. And we share the belief that the transcendent and the divine that made us and within which we live and move and have our being made us for the purpose of striving for that state and ultimately achieving it. Well, it simply defies reason to say that if that is the reality in which we exist, that violence and hatred and elimination of the outsider could possibly be a tool for achieving that end. It's simply not possible. So the only way we can create the very thing for which we were created is to use the weapons of peace, to begin living shalom and salam in the halting and incomplete way that we, of course, must in this time and in this place and in this world, but right here and right now. And it means that our weapons are, in a way, very weak. The weapons of the second religion are far flashier and, at first glance, far more effective. But in gathering today the way we have, we are employing those weapons of peace to the fullest. And let's not wait until something like this happens again before we do this again. Tomorrow, when there's nothing horrible in the news headlines, let's do it again anyway. And same with the next day, and the next day, and the next season next Ramadan, next Passover, next Holy Week and Easter, next festival, next occasion, next opportunity to simply smile at your neighbor who looks and believes and speaks very differently from you. Let's do it every single day. Those weapons of peace will win. Ronald Moore from the ACLU. Standing next to me is uh, Erica Leonard, our chapter board chairperson. Again, doesn't it rip your heart out and another hate crime, all emotions awakened? a pain and sorrow and fear that traverses the sea to us, even here and now. Hate knows no faith, no ethnic, nor racial, nor cultural boundary. It seeps into our communities, into our islands of trust and goodwill, dividing and dishonoring our connections and integrity and threatening our peace, tranquility, and security. There are too many attempts to rip apart the fabric of our mutual humanity, forces against our personal and conjoined selves brought against us to break our wills, attempts to separate our connections, to replace our hope with despair. We come together in our despair, but in our unity, we give one another strength and hope. The broken bone heals stronger than before. Into this darkened vision, we search for light and find it in our mutual grieving, unity, and unwavering commitment to mutual respect, equality, and the standing together for human rights. Those of us of the Alameda County Paul Robeson chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union of Northern California, while speaking as volunteers, stand with you in your grief and sorrow. We are appalled at all actions of hate. The American Civil Liberties Union fights to make sure that the rights and liberties guaranteed by our United States Constitution applies to immigrants regardless of immigration status. We challenge the serious civil rights violations faced by immigrant communities. We do so through litigation and legislation, 
and seeking out those with whom we stand with against justice. I have trouble reading this last fine line without getting teary-eyed. I'm starting to do it again. I will be 78 years old in three months. I have seen so much despair and hurt. It continues to break my heart. But together we have hope and healing. Our, our coming together on this day is one embodiment of the collective power that will and that must rise in response to all acts of violence and hate motivated by Islamophobia, as well as in response to all other bias motivated violence, harassment, and discrimination. As I look at everyone here, I am confident that such acts will only serve to fuel our commitment to love and to find our devotion to one another. We will not give in to hate in any form it takes. On behalf of the board of the HCLU of Northern California's Paul Robeson Alameda County Chapter, all of us volunteers who are your Alameda County neighbors. I stand before our Muslim neighbors especially offering deepest condolences with the acute awareness that condolences alone would be hollow and insignificant without action. That standing in solidarity at this time requires a profound an enduring reinvestment in our commitment to fight against discrimination and injustice and for civil rights and liberties to be enjoyed fully and equally by all. We commit to standing with you, our Muslim neighbors and family members and colleagues, and working together toward a future free from fear of identity-based violence in our neighborhoods our communities, our workplaces, and our houses of worship. Uh, this necklace that I'm wearing was given to me by a dear friend in New Zealand. She gave it to me years ago as I headed in to face a challenge that I needed uh, to face alone. And with her gift, I was less alone. And so I was strengthened by connection and community. The symbol is a traditional fish hook symbol of the Maori people, the indigenous people of New Zealand, who are themselves no strangers to bias and discrimination. It's a symbol that represents, among other good wishes, strength. It reminds me on this day of the true potential of caring, compassion, and connection as we a gathering of people of all faiths, as well as of people who, like me, represent no faith tradition. As we gather to grieve and seek healing together in community here, she in New Zealand and they and their Muslim neighbors and allies grieve and seek healing together there. And we are connected then and strengthened our shared commitment is by far greater than any act of hate. So let us each go forward carrying the strength of us all here and there, but not just carry it, use it, and fight for what is right. Congressman Eric Swallow. Assalamu alaikum. We are here as a community in this center of worship, a community so 
diverse, a community so welcoming, to mourn for the lives that were lost in New Zealand, but also to share an experience of loss ourselves as Americans. We have seen a carousel of hate across our globe. And no faith seems to be spared. It wasn't too long ago that this community came together to mourn with our Jewish friends after the shooting at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. We've mourned a Sikh temple in Wisconsin, a Baptist church in Charleston, Christians praying in Texas. And we come together today to say no faith is an enemy. To the Muslim Americans, to the Muslim people of the Tri-Valley, I want you to know, as the congressman of this area, that you are not only welcome, you are what makes this area thrive. Your strength, your courage, your prayers, your bonds with your families. A couple years ago, I was in Islamabad meeting with their national security advisor, and I was presented with a rug, beautiful Pakistani rug. And I asked the person presenting me with the rug, what makes a rug of high value or a good quality rug? I confided in him that my wife and I usually only buy rugs at Target, so we didn't really, really know. And what he said to me, I'll never forget. He said, a high quality rug is one with the most knots per square inch. The more knots, the higher quality. And when he said that to me, I couldn't help but think of this beautiful community where we all live that has become more and more diverse and more welcoming of different faiths and different people. And that it is our knots per square inch, the different threads of who we are, the diversity that is woven together, that is our strength and our quality. And we are stronger today because Jews and Muslims and Christians and Mormons and non-theists have come together to mourn. But what we also say is that if America is going to condemn the attack that happened in New Zealand, we can only have clarity and leadership in our condemnation if we, too, lead by example. And we must be honest that as a country, we're falling short. We have to take care of white nationalism in our own country. We have to take care of anti-Semitism in our own country. We have to take care of Islamophobia and a Muslim ban that still exists in our own country. Otherwise, we are not pure and we are not leaders when we call on the rest of the world to denounce hate if we're not seen with credibility as doing it ourselves. So let us all individually in our own homes, at our children's schools, but also collectively and mosques like this band together and show our strength and expect more of those who lead us and expect that those who lead us will reflect what has bonded us all together. My heart breaks for Christchurch. Your heart breaks for Christchurch.
but we're going to get stronger. We will heal from this. And we will be able to look at our children and say that we came together after one of the greatest, most devastating tragedies that ever occurred to people of faith in our lifetime, people we had never met. And because we came together, our children's future was a little more inclusive, a little more accepting, and a little more bright. Thank you to the MCC for convening us. Thank you to each and, one, each and every one of you for caring so much to come. And may the memories of those 50 individuals an ocean and time zones away never be lost, but carried on in the respect and dignity we show for each other. People of different faith, people who are our neighbors, people who are all our fellow Americans. Thank you. Hossai Majadidi. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, I greet you all with the universal greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Dear respected guests, esteemed panelists, and beloved community members, I'd like to personally, as well as on behalf of the MCC, express my deepest gratitude to each and every one of you for being here today. Earlier this morning, I was at another local mosque, the San Ramon Valley Islamic Center, where I spoke to a large group of middle and high school students during their Sunday school program about this recent tragedy. Prior to my talk, the students were given index cards and asked to submit questions or comments about the attack how they were feeling, and their reflections in general. There were th several thoughtful comments and questions about the attack itself, the motivations of the terrorists, the victims and their families, their suffering, and how we as a community can better protect ourselves from future attacks. As I was going through each card and I looked at at their sweet and innocent faces, and how deeply puzzled and conflicted they were by how someone could do something so heinous, I had to fight back my tears. Our children have, sad, have sadly inherited a world that is rife with confusion, hatred, and violence. Their normal is nothing like our normal when we were their age. We were busy being children, oblivious to the darkness of the world, while they are children who've been born into it and are surrounded by it every day. Like ships that are sailing aimlessly and lost at sea, they too are desperately looking for the light. And that is why the work that we do matters so much. Whether we are fighting on the front lines of this battle politically, reaching people through education and dialogue, or we're protecting the beautiful souls that come to our respective spiritual centers for guidance, we are all shining our light in one way or another. But when we come together, as we are right now, in this moment and in this sacred space, and we put our lights together, we create a beautiful kaleidoscope of different colors and shapes that reflect stronger, brighter, and has a much farther reach. When we stand together and speak in one unified and beautiful voice, just as we have today, we effectively drown out all the noise and ugliness born out of hatred and violence. 
In the aftermath of these horrific events that have become far too common in our broken world, we may not be first responders in the technical sense, but we are certainly part of the triage team, spiritually speaking. Many people look to us for strength, for help, and for healing. May God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, give us renewed and continued strength and patience to help as many souls and heal as many hearts as we possibly can. I will end with one of my favorite quotes from one of the most beloved television personalities ever that we all know, Mr. Rogers, who once said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. May God always count us among the helpers, and may he increase our numbers so that our light eclipses whatever darkness may come our way. Thank you, and may God bless you all. Iman Tai. to move this way down. Um, <clears throat> to begin with, I'm going to um, read a poem that I just wrote yesterday. So um, please forgive me if it's not well thought out yet. <clears throat> Hearing the stories of people we've lost sends me spinning. Spinning golden threads of memories, laced with tears, tempered with fears, searching for meaning in their post-truth tomes, wading through the sands of time with a comb. It's the almost excessive access to the horror that oppresses my dome, my domain of private soul space where every person in the human race has their rights and their place, at a table of inalienable grace, served up not by false nobility but by divine soliloquy. So it can't just be me. I can't be the only one who senses, who sees, hears, feels my heart peel like an onion so strong. It burns through the smoke of this terrible yoke of hate and bigotry, of political idolatry. Home of the brave, land of the free, we've lost our way far at sea. I mean, when you've got more black men in lockup than the entire South African roundup, and more souls living in the city streets, than the entire Mendocino County beat. But all we hear on the news are the crews from the right who think their might makes them right when they're all four ways of wrong, singing an old song of oppression and privilege, of dashed dreams and dribblage. They turn us all into terrorists with a flick of a wrist. We end up on no-fly lists or a bunch of undocumented criminal immigrants, all without a second thought and not for naught. They raise their orange alerts, red and orange alerts to steadily assert their sense of reality and readily pervert our sense of morality. Then all this can mean is the nightmares have supplanted the dreams. And laughter has been supplanted by screams as shots ring out in churches, synagogues, and mosques. We must all understand the cost. And all I keep thinking is, what can I do? What choice can I make? What chances am I willing to take? Will I fear to be me? Will I fear to speak truth and poetry? Or will I walk with dignity? So echoing the call of our creed, I say, serve human needs. Serve another with compassion, whether or not it's out of fashion. Remember, the unknown soldier's worthy of remembrance precisely because no one knows his name. His cause is his moniker and his end game. Would he have fought less valiantly would he, have said, would he have said, it's all about me? Or did he give his life to see the best there is in Lady Liberty? We must all be the heroes we're destined to be in our everyday choices with our average voices. We must call out for what's right and shun the wrong so that in these darkest nights, through this crucible of pain and fright, we can find the strength to stay our path and reach for light. With that, I'd like to just talk a little bit about each one of the victims. I'm going to cycle through.
The first is Ozair Kader. He's 24 and a student pilot at the International Aviation Academy of New Zealand and had been in Christchurch for just a year when he was killed on Friday. Sayed Jahandad Ali, 43, from Pakistan, was one of the 50 kills, victims killed on Friday. Mahboud Alaraja Korkar, 65, who was visiting his family in New Zealand and was due to return to India on Sunday. Husna Ara Parveen, who was reportedly gunned down after having saved children and, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to change this. So this is the gentleman who was visiting his son. This is Husna Abda Praveen, who was a school teacher, uh, or Sunday school teacher, and she got a number of the women and children out from the mosque, came back in to find her husband, and that's when she was gunned down. Ashraf Ali, a respected imam at the Masjid al Noor, who was originally from Fiji. Sayyid Arib Ahmed, 26, from Karachi. <clears throat> Linda Armstrong, a native New Zealander, Islam, embraced Islam years ago and was a well-known face at the mosque. Tariq Omar, 24, who is remembered for his kind, humble nature and was a former student of Kashmir High School in Christchurch. Six-year-old Abdul Fatah Qasim from Palestine, who was also killed on Friday. He was the Muslim Association of Canterbury's former board secretary. Suhail Shahid from Pakistan. Four-year-old Abdullahi Diri, who was named amongst the dead, but he, both he and his father Adnan were shot, while four of his siblings escaped unharmed. Abdullahi's family fled Somalia in the 90s and made New Zealand their home. He was the youngest of his family. We don't have a picture of him. Al Madani, 64, who's a retired engineer who made New, England, New Zealand his home. Ata Aliyan was reportedly killed on Friday. He was a national level football player and has been remembered as an inspiration. He had a brand new baby girl who was less than two months old. Kamal Darwish, 38, who moved to Christ Church from Jordan only six months ago and was awaiting the arrival of his wife and three children. This gentleman and this, their father and son. Ramiz Arif Bhai Vora, 28, and his father Arif Bhai Muhammad Ali Vora, 58, were both shot dead on Friday while worshiping together. The 28 year old lived and worked in Christ Church and had a baby daughter one week before he was killed on Friday. Muhammad Omar Farooq, 36, from Bangladesh. Amongst the other victims is Munir Suleiman, 68, from Egypt, who was a design engineer and worked at Scott's Engineering in Christchurch since 1997. Zaheen Reza, 38, is also amongst those killed and was a mechanical engineer who moved to New Zealand from Pakistan in 2018. Both he and his parents, Ghulam Hussein and Karam Bibi, were killed at the Linwood Masjid Mosque. I don't have any pictures of them. Ansi Alibaba came to New Zealand to pursue a master's degree in agribusiness management at Lincoln University. Lilik Abdul Hamid, 58, was from Medan, Indonesia, and he died on Friday, leaving behind two children. This is the youngest of the people that were killed that day. Three-year-old Mossad Ibrahim died in the arms of his father and brother who only survived because they played dead. 
Musad Ibrahim was attending Friday prayers with his father and older brother Abdi Ibrahim when the gunman stormed into Al Noor Mosque. It is believed that at the time of the attack, he ran away from his gunman while his father and brother were playing dead. This is Amjad Hamid, 57. He was a senior medical officer of cardiology and a rural hospital consultant in Huera Hospital in New Zealand. He moved to New Zealand 23 years ago because he wanted a better future for himself and his wife, and he is remembered for his kindness, compassion, and sense of humor. Haji Daud Nabi, 71, father of five and a retired engineer, moved to New Zealand from Afghanistan in 1977 and set up a new life as one of the first Muslims in New Zealand. He is believed to be amongst the dead from Friday's shooting. Khalid Musafa arrived in New Zealand only a few months ago from Syria with his family. He and his son Hamza, who was 16, also died. Osama Adnan Abu Quick, 37, from Palestine, was in the process of applying for New Zealand citizenship when he was killed on Friday. This is Muhammad Haq from Bangladesh. Another amongst the dead is Musa Vali Suleiman Patel who was visiting Christ Church to see his son and was a highly respected leader of the Fiji Muslim League in New Zealand. He left behind his wife, Saira Bibi Patel, three daughters and two sons. This is Talha Naim. He was shot at the Majid Noor this last Friday. This is his father, Naim Rashid. Witnesses have said that after watching his son shot, he got up to wrestle the gun away from the shooter on Friday. His bravery allowed others time to escape, but he was badly wounded and sadly later died in hospital. Hussein Al Omari was a regular at Majid al Noor where he was killed. Muhammad Abdusi Samad. 66 from Bangladesh, was a lecturer at Lincoln University and frequently led prayers at Majlul Noor. This is Kashmir High School student in Christ Church, Sayed Milne, 14, who was at Friday prayers when the shooting started and is believed to be dead. His father, his father has publicly spoken of his loss and is hard to be consoled. <coughs> Dr. Harun Mahmoud leaves a wife and two children, ages 13 and 11. These last few people are people that are missing and or injured, and we're not sure what their status is. A spokesperson for the Pakistani Ministry of Foreign Affairs has confirmed that five Pakistani citizens are missing. Amongst them is Sayyid Jahandar Ali, who is believed to have died. <coughs> Wasim Daragme is a Muslim barber who immigrated from Jordan five years ago. He and his beautiful daughter were shot on Friday, and they're in critical condition. This is uh, one of the wives of the man that is missing, and she's still hoping for good news about her husband. Thank you all for listening. We're going to end the program with some Quran recitation. I'm going to invite uh, Mahdi Amin to please come recite some Quran so we can end on a positive note.
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين يا أيها الناس إنا خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد God we begin in your name and we end in your name we begin calling you and we end calling you because we need you we need you sometimes we think sometimes we forget how much we need you sometimes we feel like we're independent of you but we need you and we thank you we thank you profusely for letting us feel in these moments like we are in the eye of the storm. We thank you for this beautiful moment that we have shared here as humankind. We thank you for letting this heinous murderer who tried to bring hate, he failed because I see love. We thank you. He tried to make Muslims feel unwelcome, but I feel more welcome. We thank you. He tried to make mosques feel more foreign, but people have discovered that their doors are unlocked without gates. We thank you, although he threw some bullets, many more flowers were thrown. We thank you. He tried to divide us, but you have brought us together. We thank you as he failed to incite despair. Actually, we see more hope. He tried to make us weaker, but we are in fact stronger. We pray to you, O oh Lord, O oh powerful, O oh magnificent, O oh mighty, for those who have passed away, that you have mercy on them. Amin. And that you are gentle with their families, with the weeping widows, the crying mothers, the crying husbands, the crying fathers, the poor children and the orphans. We ask you to take care of them as only you are capable of taking care of them. And we ask you, Almighty Lord, in this moment, to not let them die in vain. Not let them die in vain. Let us wake up and continue to wake up. Let us wake up as humanity and as continents and as countries and as communities and as villages and as towns and as families and as individuals. Let them not die in vain. We ask you, to let us live out our personal lives with the strength of love. It's easy 
for us to love when people are lovable to us. But we ask you to let us have the true kind of love and to love others when they are not so lovable to us. We ask you to let us connect with the one who pushes us away, to give the one who's stingy to us, and to forgive the one who harms us. We ask you to let us be people in this world of confusion to bring clarity. Where there is darkness, we bring light. Where there is ugliness, we bring beauty. Where there is hate, we bring love. Where there is vice, we bring virtue. Where there is commotion, we bring stillness. Where there is conflict, we bring peace. Where there is ignorance, we bring knowledge. Where there is fear, we bring safety. And where there is pain, we bring healing. We call upon you. We turn to you in this moment. We ask you to accept our prayers. We ask you to grant us the mindfulness of you that prevents us from disobedience. We ask you to grant us obedience that leads us to your paradise. And we ask you to give us the conviction and certainty in our hearts that let us navigate the difficulties of this world. We ask you to accept our prayers. And we thank you for bringing us all together here today. We thank you. We thank you. When I look out, I see a carpet with many knots right now, the most beautiful carpet. And we thank you, O majestic Lord, for this moment. And we ask you, we ask you to grant us sincerity, to give us victory over our own egos, and to let us be victorious over our own inner egos. We ask you to send peace and blessings upon all the messengers that you sent to us. Adam from Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Ishmael and Solomon and David and Lot and Jah and Moses and Joseph and Jacob and Zechariah and John and Moses and all of the prophets, including in our belief in the Islamic tradition, Jesus and Muhammad, peace be upon all of them. We thank you for sending them as gifts to humanity. And we ask you to gather us all in your heaven, all in paradise. When we leave from our seats today, let us be forgiven. Let us be forgiven. Let us be closer to you, more love to you. Let us be sources of beauty wherever we go vessels of happiness wherever we go. Let us, wherever we go, we bring happiness to others. And not whenever we go, we bring happiness to others. We ask you, in this world of difficulty, in this world where it's a, it's a storm and a hurricane, to let us be in that eye. Safety. And we thank you for the safety you've given us, for the comfort you've given us, and for this beautiful country you've given us. We thank you for that. And sometimes we fall short and forget and neglect to thank you. And we think you're far. And we take credit for the gifts you've given us. But we ask you, in spite of that, to forgive us. We ask you not to deprive us of the good that you have because of the bad that we may do. Accept our prayers. Accept our prayers. We belong to you. And to you we shall return. We belong to you, and to you we shall return. We ask you once again to not let them pass or die in vain, to let them mourn in peace, and to bring peace and comfort and healing to their families, and to elevate humanity out of this, to elevate humanity. And I ask you for all of the guests that have come to show their love to the Muslim community, we ask you to bless them and their families. Ameen. We ask you to bless them and their families. Ameen. They have showed an act of kindness, but you are more kind. Be kind to them, Ya Allah. They have shown an act of love, but you are more loving. Show them love, Ya Allah. They have shown an act of generosity, but you are the most generous. Show them generosity, Ya Allah. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. Oh God, Lord, Creator, 
to you we belong and to you we shall return. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, and we ask for your forgiveness. And our final prayers are all praise is due to you. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalamu alaikum. Okay, with that, we're going to end today's program, and I hope we don't ever have to meet like this again, but I pray we do keep meeting, and we see you again in our Muslim Community Center, and we get to grow in friendship with one another. We've got snacks and treats in the back that we'd like to share with all of you in the banquet hall. We've also got three tables set up, one by CARE, the Council of, on American Islamic Relations, and another table that has uh, information about the Islamic faith for anybody who might be curious. And then our third table has flowers and cards from the greater community that have been dropped off here that you may want to take a look at. Thank you again for coming. May God bless you all.